All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, this is Christina Anderson from Wisconsin Land and Water, and we are going to start our first uh, webinar for, um, for our groundwater series that starts today, and will be there'll be three more upcoming in every Thursday in October. So October 11th next week, we'll have Sarah Yang from the Department of Health Services. Um, talking about the human health effects of nitrate and drinking water. On October 18th, we'll have um, Beth Finzer and some folks from DNR talking about some of the databases and public wells next accessing data through their portals. And on the October 25th, we'll have Kevin Masark talking to us from uh, UW Stevens Point about uh, private well monitoring programs. So thank you all for joining us for our first uh, webinar with. Ken Bradbury is joining us from Wisconsin Geological and Natural History Survey. Uh, he'll be describing some basic concepts relating to groundwater flow, groundwater quality, groundwater quantity in Wisconsin, and he'll also discuss the types of information available about Wisconsin's groundwater, including maps, reports, and data sources, how to find them, and where to go for more detail. Uh, I know that Ken's got quite a bit to talk about, so we will let him get started. Um, this is also going to be recorded and we'll post this on our website. I'll share that with you at the end of our webinar. Thanks. Uh, take it away, Ken. Okay, thanks Christina and good morning everyone. Uh, I'm pleased to, pleased to be here to talk about uh, groundwater in, in Wisconsin. Um, uh, during my talk, I, uh, if you have questions, I would go ahead and type them into the chat box and I will try to answer them as we go. Um, unless there's too many to answer and I may pull some of them, but I'll try to answer them as we go and I think you should have a chat box on your screen. So what I'm going to do this morning is, is talk about basics of groundwater um, flow in, in, in Wisconsin and then I'll finish up with uh, uh, some discussion of, of resources of where to get more information about, about Wisconsin's groundwater and geology. Yeah, I'm a little slow getting going. Um, so, what is groundwater? Uh, many of you probably know this, but groundwater is the water that fills pores, cracks, fractures, and other voids in, in the materials beneath the, the Earth's surface. Uh, and it's in these cracks, pores, fractures, and spaces between grains. And this is just a classic, the classic diagram um, that started with Binder at the USGS many years ago. Uh, of, of the porosity, and on the top we've got uh, uh, prime, what's called primary porosity, where we think of things like grains of sand, and the, the pores uh, are the spaces between the grains of sand. If that sand is well sorted, all the grains are about the same size. If it's poorly sorted, the grains are of different sizes, and actually the, the general porosity is a little less. Um, but of course in Wisconsin we also have a lot of formations that have secondary openings, which are openings that happen after the deposition of the material, such as fractures in a, in a crystalline rock like granite, or caves or karst features in a, in a limestone or a dolomite. And just an example of a couple of uh, porous media, uh, these are, these are uh, Cambrian sandstones, and uh, up on the upper right here, this diagram, this is a, a microscope picture of some Wisconsin, um, some sandstone right beneath uh, Madison here, and you can see this is a hydrogeologist's dream aquifer. It's uh, everything is uh, the, the grains are very well rounded, they're very well sorted, they're all about the same size, and uh, they're all very clean. This is a, almost a pure quartz sandstone. Uh, on the lower left, you see some some more typical Cambrian sandstone with sort of some cross bedding. Um, this uh, porosity of materials like this is between usually between 10 and 15 percent. And of course, uh, we don't only have sandstone in Wisconsin. We have a lot of, of, of carbony rock, such as dolomite or limestone. And here's some fractured dolomite in Door County. And, and uh, uh, you can imagine that groundwater moves through this not so much through the pores as through the cracks and fractures. And generally, generally moves fairly rapidly and can, there can be little attenuation of contaminants. And also you see in, in this area there's no soil at the surface to filter any contaminants that are coming in. So uh, this is an area where there's actually great vulnerability to contamination. Of course we need to understand the water cycle when we're talking about groundwater or surface water and how they're connected. Uh, so 
just a general diagram about the water cycle, remembering that everything starts as precipitation, rain or snow at the surface, and then uh, the majority of that water uh, runs off, just like it's uh, doing in Madison today and tonight, uh, going into lakes and streams and wetlands, and uh, but a small proportion uh, in Wisconsin, something on the order of 10 inches a year, um, infiltrates, becomes part of the groundwater system, which means it moves down through the unsaturated zone, crosses the water table, and becomes part of the groundwater system through which it moves, um, and moves uh, either a short distance to a, maybe a well or a lake or a wetland, or it can be part of a, a longer groundwater flow path, and it can move from shallow to deep deep aquifers if, if given enough time and, and the right uh, uh, the right hydraulic gradients. Eventually, though, all the water is going to end up uh, at some kind of discharge point and uh, evaporate or evapotranspire and go back to the atmosphere and, and the system begins again. Uh, just to remind you what the water table is, the water table is the top of the saturated zone below the water table. All those pores or cracks or fractures are filled with water. Above the water table in the unsaturated zone, there's still moisture there, but the pores are not completely filled. There's, they're partly filled with, with air. And then uh, at, right above the water table, we have something called the capillary fringe, which is um, an area where, where water is drawn up into the pores by capillary action, similar to how a water might go up into a capillary tube or a soda straw. Uh, that's not a terribly important thing to understand for most problems that we deal with. Uh, it's only a, usually a few inches in most in most places in Wisconsin. Groundwater moves, um, although it moves slowly, but it moves and it moves in three dimensions. It moves from generally in, in a humid place like Wisconsin from higher parts of the landscape to lower parts of the landscape. Um, but as we pull this figure apart, we can see it also moves vertically. So water is moving from these the tops of the landscape toward a discharge area, but it's also moving down under the under higher elevation and and up toward discharge points. And these divides are called groundwater divides. Groundwater doesn't necessarily ever cross those divides unless uh, the divide is moved by pumping or land use change or something like that. And so the, the groundwater system is, is often a sort of a subdued um, uh, replica of the surface topography in, in, in many areas. So groundwater basins are largely, although ex not exactly the same as surface water basin. But it's important to remember that we have three-dimensional groundwater movement and the groundwater can actually move upward under, uh, un under these low places in the landscape near, near lakes and rivers and streams and springs. And that's because the hydraulic uh, gradient that's driving it is starts at a high elevation and then is is uh, conducted through the ground here. Uh, how long is it in the ground? Well, that can vary from uh, uh, a few days to many years to hundreds or thousands of years, depending on where we are in the geology and 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 the, and the time and distance needed. So groundwater is moving from recharge to discharge areas. Recharge areas are usually areas that are somewhat higher in the landscape, and it moves through a groundwater flow system from recharge to discharge. And again, the discharge can happen at a stream or a lake or also at a, at a pumping well. And the time of flow can, again, range from very short, a few days, to very long, depending on how deep the water can move. Uh, and the, the depth and length of its flow path is, is determined by geology. Uh, whether we have these aquitards or confining beds, which would be lower permeability materials like, like a clay or a shale, those can uh, retard the water and, and force it to go deeper and be uh, part of these deeper long, long term flow paths, or the, some, some of the water can just move very rapidly. And again, it's going to depend a lot upon the material it's moving through as well. And so, uh, just to give you an idea, we, we often say groundwater moves very slowly, and that's true. Uh, in uh, something like a clay, uh, we know water can sometimes move just a few inches per year, or even less than that. Uh, it can be in water for many, many, many years, in the ground for many, many, many years. Sandstones uh, in a, a typical 
uh, groundwater velocity in southern Wisconsin and some of our Cambrian sandstones would be in the tens of feet per year. But if we get into fractured media like limestone and dolomite, we can get much faster movement, hundreds to thousands of feet per day sometimes. And uh, of course, if you're getting that kind of movement, you have little time for biodegradation or filtration uh, or attenuation of contaminants. And so, so some of these limestones and dolomites are, are very susceptible to contamination. And, and many of our sandstones are as well. Uh, but frac in fractured media, you can get very rapid uh, groundwater movement, even though the the, the uh, volumes of water that's moving can be can be small. Um, wetlands, and we have a lot of those in Wisconsin, are often dis groundwater discharge points, and that's what sustains uh, streams and wetlands. And so we have a here. These are here's some springs up in the Mink River estuary in Door County, but we have many trout streams in Wisconsin uh, that are that flow perennially, and that's because they're they're uh, sustained by groundwater discharge. So these are these are the discharge points uh, for groundwater. Now let's take a look at a, a general overview of Wisconsin's aquifers. We have, and Wisconsin's a, a fabulous place to live and work because we have really great groundwater here and, and great aquifers. Uh, I've I've been in many other parts of the United States and the world, and and really. Uh, there's nowhere like Wisconsin for groundwater, um, so we get and we have a very varied state. Um, so, but we can divide our aquifers into into just a few categories. Uh, we have on the eastern side of the state, uh, we have the Silurian uh, Dolomite, and that covers the area shaded here from the tip of Thor County uh, down to Racine and Kenosha, on uh, going over you know over about to Lake Winnebago and these are rocks like you see in the picture here that are uh, part of the part of the Niagara escarpment that wraps around to Niagara Falls uh, over in over in Canada, uh, wraps around the Michigan Basin. Uh, these are these are dolomites and limestones that uh, tend to be fractured. Uh, they are often near the surface, except where they're where they're not. There are there are places they are buried, but often, particularly in eastern Wisconsin and, and in the Door Peninsula. Uh, parts of Brown, Kiwani County, the, the rock is very near the surface. Uh, and so they're quite susceptible to contamination. They're also most of a very important shallow aquifer for many uh, homeowners and communities up in, in that region of the state. Over much of the rest of southern Wisconsin, we have uh, a sandstone, what's, what's called the sandstone aquifer, although it's not completely sandstone. There are, there are uh, dolomite and limestone uh, strata within there, but uh, uh, it's, it's generally called the sandstone aquifer. And the best place to see what most of it looks like would be to go to the Wisconsin Dells and take the boat trip, and 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 see that these are this is often the thousand feet or more of thickness of, of a pretty well sorted uh, sandstone that's that's uh, uh, forms really a prolific aquifer. And this is the aquifer that. Uh, Many of the the deep high capacity wells in Wisconsin are tapping, like all the all the um, municipal wells here in Madison. The wells over in Waukesha are tapping it because that, this these rocks go under the dolomites to the to the east. So these rocks are are below uh, below these dolomites to the east, and and you can see they cover uh, you know about uh, about two thirds of Wisconsin. And then in uh, northern Wisconsin, we have the the, the uh, crystalline or Precambrian rocks that are that are um, often near the surface. Uh, these these are uh, up in, in north central Wisconsin. This is called the crystalline aquifer. And as we go to the northwest, we get into the Mid-Continent Rift System. These are very old Precambrian rocks, mostly crystalline rocks like like the quartzite or granite. Um, a large variety of very interesting rocks there. Generally, they don't contain a lot of groundwater, though. And um, so we are looking for water there in, in fractures and cracks. Wells finished in those rocks often don't uh, produce a lot of a lot of uh, water. Uh, so people often have a hard time finding enough water supply for at least for large wells in those in those rocks. Many there are many domestic wells that are getting you know, 10 gallons a minute or less out of those rocks, but uh, 
it's hard to find, it's hard to develop high capacity wells in those rocks. Now, fortunately, uh, above those rocks, we have glacial deposits. And so here's a, here's a cartoon of, of the, the glaciation that happened in, in Wisconsin over the last million years. And uh, the number of lobes we had that, uh, that came down and covered much of the state. Uh, so the glaciation came from the Laurentide ice sheet and we had these large glacial lobes that left, left uh, uh, massive changes in the, in the landscape. Uh, um, and dammed up uh, uh, lakes such as Glacial Lake Wisconsin that I'll talk about in a, in a minute here. Uh, and so they left materials at the landscape that form a shallow, what's often called the sand and gravel aquifer, which is not uh, continuous like the bedrock aquifers. It's somewhat patchy. Uh, it's located along river valleys like the Wisconsin River, uh, uh, located in places where, where the glacial uh, the glaciers left sand and gravel. Now the glaciers also left uh, a lot of clay in places, uh, particularly old lake beds, which aren't very good aquifers. But the but the places where the sand and gravel is present often produce a great shallow aquifer. And, and a good example of that is the Central Sands, where you had you have a, a, a shallow but very prolific aquifer that that allows us to do a lot of center pivot irrigation there. Um, and just to, here's an, just an example of a cut in a in a in a sand uh, body near West Bend. And so this this is an important shallow aquifer, but because it's near the surface and it's very sandy and permeable, often pretty vulnerable to contamination. Uh, I'd like to show this slide, and many of you maybe have seen this before, but just to give an idea of of, of the depths of these rocks in in Wisconsin, and and the idea is a concept of how deep wells are. Many people I don't think understand this too well. So this is what we're looking at here is a view of Milwaukee. If you were out in a boat in Lake Michigan, looking at here's the harbor and the downtown, and this is all the scale. And I've got the the basic stratigraphy of of southern Wisconsin under here. We have the Dolomite Aquifer, the Coquitlam Shale, and then the Cambrian Sandstone, and then way at the bottom we have granite. And this is all to scale, so that the uh, tallest buildings in Milwaukee are about 600 feet high. And and so the, the 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 rocks here are given to scale too. So domestic wells like the one I have at my house, which is you know about 150 feet deep, or uh, you know they're about uh, uh, maybe a third as deep as the tallest building in Milwaukee. Uh, and and that's what the majority of majest, uh, domestic wells in the in the state are are like. Most of the municipal wells in Wisconsin are uh, between 200 and 800 feet deep, and many of them tap the sandstone, but they're on the order of about as deep as the tallest building in Milwaukee. And so if you're in downtown Milwaukee and you look up, that's, you know, see how far that is? That's about as deep as, as a well would be. But some of the deepest wells over in that part of the state are nearly uh, 2,000 feet deep, um, far deeper than the tallest building in, in, in Milwaukee. and you know, that makes you think about a couple of things. First of all, the cost and effort of drilling a hole that deep, uh, and some of these were drilled 100 years ago. So imagine the, the, the municipal effort that went into constructing wells like that. And then you have to also imagine the, the cost, the energy cost of moving that water, not only from the deep sandstone, but also then up to the top of one of these buildings for using it. It's not a trivial thing. So energy and, and, and groundwater use are, are pretty tightly uh, related to each other. Uh, so, but anyway, just an idea about the depths of, depths of water. I wanted to spend a minute on flowing wells. I, I, I said a few minutes ago that uh, because uh, groundwater moves to, through flow systems, groundwater can actually flow upward uh, because it's, it's, it's uh, containing the, the uh, energy and the pressure that it started with at a higher elevation. And so we see these flowing wells, also called artesian wells, in many places in Wisconsin, and they're usually in low places near surface water bodies, low places in the landscape. So you find flowing wells in valleys, along rivers, near lakes, and places where groundwater is discharging. And the reason wells flow is, is a casing has, and, and a hole has been drilled and a casing put in the ground. And so the, the well casing is, a, is a, an easier path for water to move up than following the torturous path through all the, the cracks and fractures so it comes out of the well. And if, it's, if it comes out above the land surface, that's called an artesian well. 
and wells and, and and this is how springs form as well of course and so wells and springs are important because they were always they were often the the uh, uh, reason that people settled in certain places that they could find water and um, we've done um, surveys of springs in Wisconsin uh, springs where water is na naturally flowing and there are over 10,000 mapped springs there are certainly more springs than that this is a map of of all the map springs that were mapped a, n a number of years ago, and some counties were mapped more heavily than others, which is why it's a little, um, it maybe looks a little odd. Why, why do you have a lot of springs in one county and none next door? It's because one county had more effort put into mapping. Since then, we've we've updated this, and we so we have a, a better idea of springs now. But springs have been important historically, particularly in Waukesha, where spring water was, was sold, and Waukesha was called the, the spring city. And um, we, as uh, springs are pretty dynamic places for, for, as a hydrogeologist, we don't often see excitement in groundwater studies, but it's kind of, I think it's pretty cool to see uh, flowing, flowing springs bubbling under uh, underwater here. This is a Cadiz Springs in Greene County. So let's talk, let's start talking a little bit about how, how do you use information. I mentioned this diagram and how we, how groundwater moves in three dimensions. This is our cartoon, but and, you know, you all want to want to make decisions, and so what, what you need is real data with maps. So we have we have these equal potential lines that show us equal levels of of groundwater. We have these arrows that show us the direction of groundwater flow, which is perpendicular to those lines. And we have a groundwater divide here. Well, we can look at that on a real map. And so here is a example of a water table map from Sauk County. And again, you see all these these uh, uh, greenish lines, which are the equal potential lines or the lines of equal water level elevation. You see some dashed lines that represent the groundwater divide, and I can blow that up a little bit. So here we're looking around Baraboo, the city of Baraboo. And again, we have, uh, if you're looking at a water table map, we have uh, these lines of uh, equal elevation and groundwater is going to flow perpendicular to those lines from higher to lower head. That's why you see the green arrows here. And then this gray line here is a groundwater divide, and groundwater is not going to cross that divide. It's going to flow away from that divide on each side. And, and you can see this is actually more complicated than that cartoon, but you can get the idea that having a map like this, you can get an idea of where groundwater is coming from, and where it's going, how it's flowing here into the Baraboo River, for example. And I'll talk in a minute about how you can find maps like this on our website and on other websites. Uh, the other concept I wanted to get across is, is the capture zone, or where water comes from for, for a well or for a spring. Uh, the capture zone is the area that on the landscape that through which water recharges and then eventually ends up at a well, and it's not necessarily right next to the well. You can see here it's it's uh, some distance up gradient. And there have been various studies where where we have used groundwater models to delineate these capture zones for some places in the state. This is how you develop a wellhead protection area. And so those capture zones can be large for, uh, say, a municipal well, but they could even exist for a, a small, uh, say, subdivision well. And here's just an example. We have a we have a a fact sheet here that talks about capture zones here, how, how uh, again, if you're looking at a subdivision, you might not want to have your drain field for the septic tank in the capture zone for your for your well. That's a, a common problem that we see in subdivisions where uh, houses and wells are pretty close together. Uh, this is a map, um, a, a publication we have of the capture zones for municipal wells in, in uh, Sauk County, and you can see that on the county scale, they're rather small, but but uh, they're clustered around, of course, the cities. And so, one of the messages here is that groundwater usually comes from fairly nearby in Wisconsin, which is a, I think, a powerful concept uh, that uh, <coughs> usually municipalities have some control over the land use in their area, uh, and they don't have to worry about something happening happening far away. But just an idea of how we how we determine where groundwater is coming from for particular wells. This was done with a groundwater flow model. Now, I know the one of the main things Christina wanted me to talk about is how do you find information about groundwater? And, and 
Um, there are many sources, but uh, I'll try to summarize the main ones. Uh, these would be county or regional studies, maps like maps of the water table, maps of depth to bedrock, maps of geology, how to find groundwater levels, how to find something about groundwater quality, how to find groundwater quantity, how, where are high capacity wells, and how to find information about specific wells. And if you have questions about other things, maybe you can ask those at the, at the end of this talk. Um, to find this information, the two good places to start is one is the, the DNR groundwater page, which you can Google on DNR or, or use this address here. Uh, and I'll show that, in, I think, in the next slide, what that page looks like. And then our WGNHS website has a lot of information as well. That's WGNHS. At uwex.edu. Um, if you go to that, first of all, that DNR site, uh, I won't go through all this right now, but uh, they've got quite a bit of, of information, how to look up groundwater data, groundwater quality, basic well parameters, well records, well construction reports, uh, well abandonment re reports, high capacity wells. And I think in a couple of weeks, one of, one of the the next webinars will focus on this. So I'm not going to spend a lot more time on that today, but just want to remind you all that this is out there. Um, I'll start with our website. This is the Wisconsin Geological and Natural History Survey, wgnhs.uwex.edu. If you go to our web page, um, the place to start is usually uh, publications. On, our, on the top here, you can click on that. That will take you to a page that looks like this, Publications Database. And then you can search. There's two ways to do it. There's a map search or what's called the classic search where you enter uh, information in boxes and click on things. And I find that's the easiest way to do that. We have a really a treasure trove of information here. Uh, one of the, over the next couple of years, we're, we're going to try to make it a little more streamlined to, to, to search the, the data, but this is what we can do now. So here you can type in, um, and if you do this live, you can you get some choices. But if you, if you have area, you can type in say a county. So here I've looked for Bayfield County. Say I want to find out what we have in Bayfield County, and if you do that, you get a number of things. And and this is just we have two pages of of different publications about the geology and groundwater of Bayfield County. Um, suppose I wanted a water table map. Here's a recent publication, water table map of Bayfield County. And so if you click on that, um, you'll bring up this page, it talks about the groundwater uh, elevation map, gives the authors and so forth. And all of our publications, you can either buy them and have us print them here, but that costs money, or you can do a free download uh, and and then print it yourself. And I think that's what most, well, I know that's what most people do these days because they're not buying as much from us as they used to. Uh, but if you click on the free download, then you can download the map and uh, have it on your computer. And, and our recent maps, um, for our recent maps, you can actually download the, the GIS files themselves. Our older maps, um, some of them are just PDFs. Uh, we are trying um, as we go along to uh, scan and digitize much of our older material so that we've, we're creating uh, uh, GIS files that people can manipulate themselves. The newer maps over the last uh, five or 10 years are, most of them have uh, GIS files that you can manipulate yourself. Um, I always caution people though that Remember, the maps are only as good as the scale they're made at. And so when, when we release a map, uh, we release it at a particular scale, which is often 1 to 100,000 or 1 to 24,000. And that's the scale that we support it at, meaning that that's what it's accurate at. With GIS, of course, you can blow it up to any scale you want. It doesn't mean that we claim that it's correct at that scale. Uh, you know, there's, because we can only map it at the scale we at the detail we we can map at so that that's a caution for using any not only our maps but anybody's maps um, here's a an example of a report recent report of uh, a place in Kiwani County the town of Lincoln uh, where we did a um, hydrogeologic characterization 
And just a, an example here, we we released here's the the actual report, and here's the data. So if you want to see the the GIS data, that's available too in shape files and metadata. These are released as open file reports. And here's an example of uh, depth to bedrock, town of Lincoln, um, uh, in, in Kiwani County. You know, there's been a lot of a lot of interest in Kiwani County. Uh, the town of Lincoln. Uh, retained us to do this map, which was released last year. One of the interesting things is, is that the, there's quite a bit of variation, even though Kiwani County has gotten a lot of attention, not all of, count, of the county is equally vulnerable, which is why this project was done. So you can see here that just in, the, in this one town, the depth of bedrock ranges from uh, less than 10 feet to over 50 feet. When we put that into a susceptibility model, we came up with this, uh, just to show you that the even in the one town, the, the some areas were far more susceptible than others, and and this is the kind of planning tool that the town asked for, and they seem to be uh, pretty happy with it. Unfortunately, we haven't done this for a lot of places in the state, but it's it's probably it's it's the kind of project that we can do, and that that others may want to do. Um, often, often people desire to see groundwater levels, and we have a groundwater level network that we uh, we run cooperatively with the DNR and with the U.S. Geological Survey. Uh, the U.S. Geological Survey handles most of the actual data. Uh, here's a map of, of the active wells. Now there are many more wells that are, there's, they may be historical data for, but these are the wells that are actively being measured now. And we can, you can, you can click on that map and you can download data. This is, for example, a well near Mazamani, west of Madison here, and near the Wisconsin River. And I thought, just to show you that you can get some pretty up-to-date data, here's data for this year showing the, the response to uh, the big rain and flooding we had in September and and just up to a few days ago, how that, that well, you know, it, it, was, it was high early in the year. It came, it was going down, 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 down throughout July until we had these big rains in August and up it's been coming again. So you can get some fairly up-to-date data from these wells, and it's it's fairly it's fairly easy to obtain. Unfortunately, they're not everywhere. Uh, groundwater quality, uh, the best resource, and the one I always my first one to go to is is Kevin Masaryk's uh, uh, Water Well Data Viewer, and I know that Kevin's going to give a whole webinar on this, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. But this is at uh, UW Stevens Point and the Center for Watershed Science and Education an online tool that you can use to query uh, water quality data that their lab has collected over the years. Uh, you can display a number of different constituents by county. This is nitrate by county. or And you can drill down for, for townships and even sections if there's enough data. So here's, uh, this is bacteria by section for um, uh, part of Sauk County. Uh, and then here's the, here are the constituents that they have online online there. So that's a that's a good way to get background information to see what general water quality trends are, something that is a great tool and we use it all the time. Groundwater quantity, where, where is water being used and how much? Well, the, the, the go-to place for there now is, is the DNR water use viewer, which is a, a more, a, a very recent tool that you can get to at this address. And it allows you to look at well applications and approvals, high capacity well locations, um, water quantity monitoring, quality monitoring, springs, and ground, even some groundwater protection information. There are a lot of different um, data sets and layers you can look at. And again, there's going to be a webinar focusing on this, so I'm not going to go in a lot of detail other than to um, show you that you can you can zoom in on an area, and here we're looking for high capacity wells by section. Now, due to due to uh, security concerns, they don't give you pinpoint accuracy of where the wells are. They're only generalized to section. But if you can drill down and say, if you want to know how many wells are in section 36 here, you can click on that, and it'll give you a list of the wells, and you can find out how much they're approved to pump and so forth. Uh, so, so that can be very useful if you want to look at how much water is being used in an area. Um, finding well construction information. Um, this is something that we do all the time. Uh, we, we use private well construction information all the time in, 
in, in groundwater studies. Um, and it's also important to address specific questions that people have about their own well, if they're having a problem with it. And, and um, if we want to know about groundwater conditions in an area, these are where we look. Uh, there are, because of the history of how, how well construction reports were collected, there are two data sets and two different ways to get data uh, depending on where the well was drilled. Um, so often you may have to look two places. And the 1989 is the key year. Wells drilled before 1989. Uh, there is actually a map viewer that lets you zoom into a well. For wells drilled after 1989, there is a database that you can search. And uh, you really need to, if you're not quite sure when the well was drilled, you may need to search both of those. Uh, there are a few cautions. Uh, well, re well construction reports, of which there are many, are filled out by well drillers. Um, we have found that often, not always, but often they are, the, the uh, locations are not accurately uh, entered into the, into the construction reports. Some are very good and some are not, and it depends a lot on, on the well driller or the well driller company over the years. Um, often they are filed, or you know, the, the, the main thing you'll see on there is the owner's name. Well, the owner of the land, of course, can change through the years. And so it's usually the owner at the time of drilling. Sometimes that owner was a, a you know, wasn't even uh, on that property. Say it was a, might have been a development company or something like that. So even that is not, maybe is not a key to finding the actual location. And, and, and so the more information you have about the well, the better when looking for construction reports. And just as an example, I looked up my own well. Uh, and so I live south of Madison. And, and if you look at the DNR well viewer, uh, viewer, I found my house. This is my house. And here's a dot that you would think is my well. But when I click on that, I get uh, my neighbor's well here. And so I know that I know my neighbor's name and I know that his well is here. So it was close, but not exactly right. Uh, and so you, you often need, and what we do here at the survey is we sometimes look back to plat books and so forth to try to make sure we've associated the correct well with the correct property. The, the key, the reason that you get something that's close but not exactly right is that these are often filed by township section and range, and you can have many houses in a single section, for example. Kind of difficult to find. And then the last thing I was going to talk about were geologic logs. Uh, now, geologic logs have a lot more detail than the well construction reports because they were prepared by geologists here at the Geological and Natural History Survey based on actual samples or well cuttings that were uh, given to us from a particular well. So they, they look like this. Uh, they have a lot more accurate information. They have an analysis of the formations penetrated and description uh, graphic section. Often the description is every five feet. Now we don't have these for every well in the state, um, but we have them for many wells. Um, uh, but they're mainly for municipal, industrial, or irrigation wells, the larger and deeper wells. Uh, we at this present time we don't have all of these online, but we if you go to this uh, address here or, or contact our office, we can find them for you. We have we have some. Uh, methods of, of, of distributing them to people. Uh, you just can't view them all, all right online, unfortunately. That is another thing we are working on. But, but this, is, this is kind of the backbone of, of looking at the state's geology, finding these logs. So I'm gonna, that's, that's pretty much what I had, so I'm gonna stop there and see if there are any questions. And thank you for paying attention and, and tuning in this morning. And, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have at this time. And I'll, let you do that or turn it back to Christina. Thanks, Ken. So um, if anybody has any questions, if you do have a microphone, uh, you can um, unmute yourself and go ahead and ask Ken. Um, otherwise, if you'd like to enter it in that chat box on the GoToMeeting bar. Um, if anybody has any questions, we'll... I have a, there is one question here. Okay. Uh, from, from Bruce that says, uh, <laughs> Um, when new wells are approved, what does the DNR consider? Um, that's probably a question for for the DNR. Uh, I know that they these days, you know, that's that's been a controversial area of what they should be considering. And I think right now, the main things they are looking at is 
or is, is distance to um, uh, some um, uh, things like trout streams or springs, or perhaps to other municipal wells, but they don't. They, they, right now, at the present time, as I understand it, they are not able to consider cumulative impacts. Um, but that may be a that, that's certainly a question for the for the high capacity well approvers, and and uh, that's not me. So they, there's not a lot of consideration of of cumulative impacts at this time. I know. Uh, okay. So, it sounds like somebody else is uh, maybe either not realizing they're not muted anymore or is trying to ask a question. Is there anybody else out there? All right. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, well, uh, Ken, I can, if it's okay with you, share your contact or if you have somebody else at the um, at your office that you'd want to share. Uh, have oh, you can share. Contact. You can go ahead and share, share my contact information. I, I guess I should have put it on here. Uh, but yeah, feel free to route questions to me, and I, if I can't answer them or don't have time, I'll I'll uh, I'll get someone to answer them. So, but I'll try to respond. Um, okay. And and uh, you know, feel if you have questions that come up. After this, that you hadn't thought of or been able to formulate, uh, go ahead and go ahead and uh, and send them to uh, to me or Christina, and and we'll respond. Great, uh, thank you so much, Ken. And I, I just wanted to remind everyone we have uh, the next three Thursdays. We'll continue to do um, about a 45 minute to an hour long webinars. Um, the human health effects of nitrate will be next week with Sarah Yang. Department of Health Services, and um, and then we'll go a little bit more into those ex accessing well data at to the DNR databases, um, and then um, the following with Kevin Masaryk about private well monitoring programs. And again, I'm recording all of these, and they will be posted on our website. I'll share that website with everyone again. And um, we also do have a survey that our state interagency training committee is doing with all the trainings that are conducted through Wisconsin Land and Water and our partners and so I will it's up on the screen right now if you have a chance to jump on that otherwise I will also send that link out and have it on our website so thanks again Ken and thank you to everyone who joined us um, and we'll see you all next week thank you thanks